Did you have any doubt that you would be a good ball player when you broke in? When I first broke into professional ball, I didn't have that idea. But as I went along and was so successful with strikeouts and so on, I was pretty fast. I could throw a ball about as hard as anybody outside of Walter Johnson, probably, and there wasn't much difference between us. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to Fenway Park. This is Mark Fidrich. Now, each time he gets the ball back, you'll see him mumble a couple of words to the ball. The first man ever to pitch five career no-hitters. Catch him all, Joe! I don't believe what I just saw! Chance for Mitchell, and he makes a pair handed catch. Ricky goes, a pitch stick, and he's going to have it. Leaps high in the air, and he's got it. Oh, incredible catch by the kid. And let it be said that number eight, Cal Ripken Jr., has reached the unreachable star. Today, Today. I, consider I consider myself the luckiest, the luckiest man, man on the face, on the of, the face earth. of the earth. Now, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, we invite you to rise. Welcome to the Daily Rewind, brought to you by ThisDayInBaseball.com. My name's Tom Hannon, and I'm your host. I want to thank you for joining me today. I'm excited for you to hear today's show with the voice from the past that I, that will tell you himself. He is one of those oh-what-could-have-been players. It is an interview with one Smokey Joe Wood. Over 30-some-odd minutes long, he's going to tell you about his career, start to finish, and he's going to sprinkle in Walter Johnson, Babe Ruth, and Tris Speaker, just to name a few. I'll tell you, I'm going to steal something from John Lee Dumas here. The value bombs you're going to hear are just unbelievable. And the way he tells the stories, you can just tell he's not being politically correct here. He is just telling it the way it is. It's a really great listen, and I can't wait for you to hear it. So let's get right to it. So on today, we're talking about February 24th, 1917. Smokey Joe Wood, his arm dead at 26, is sold by the Boston Red Sox to the Cleveland Indians for just $15,000. He will become an outfielder for the Tribe after making one last start on the mound, but he will manage to play another five years. In 1912, Wood had slipped on wet grass while fielding a bunt in a game against the Detroit Tigers. He fell and broke his thumb and pitched in pain for the following three seasons. Although he maintained a winning record in low ERA, his appearances were limited as he could no longer recover quickly from pitching a game. Wood then sat out the 1916 season and most of the 1917 season, and for all intents, intents and purposes, had ended his pitching career. When Wood was sold to the Cleveland Indians, he rejoined former teammate Tris Speaker. Always proficient with the bat, he embarked on a second career like his former teammate, Babe Ruth. Wood ended his career as an outfielder. His hitting statistics, however, were far more pedestrian than those of Ruth. Nonetheless, Wood finished in the top 10 in the American League in RBIs in two seasons, in 1918 and 1922, and in 1918, he also finished in the top 10 in home runs, doubles, batting average, and total bases. Wood pitched seven more times, all but one game in relief, winning none and losing one. He also appeared in four games in the 1920 World Series, becoming the only player besides Babe Ruth to be a starting pitcher and starting outfielder in a World Series game. Wood finished his major league career after the 1922 season with a pitching record of 117 and 57 in an ERA of 203. His lifetime batting average is 283. In his final season with the Indians, he had his highest hit total of his career with 150 hits, and he also personal best with 92 RBIs. So here is Smokey Joe to tell his story. I often look back on it now. I see these Wild West pictures in the movies and on TV and so on. Now, when we lived in Colorado, Larry, and we went through all that in real life. Yeah. There was big stage coaches with the guards sitting up with their rifles on the back end, guarding gold bullion coming down from the mines. We saw all that in real life. All of that. It's just a movie to me, you know. Of course, they enlarged a little on it in all the years that we were out there, which was five years. And I used to see these big buses every day coming down from the mines with two men on there with their rifles, six horse teams, of course. But all the ones you see now, the horses are just running like hell, you know. I never saw them off a trot. <laughs> I never saw any one of them running like that in all those years. In one of those record books that I have, 
It said something about the Bloomer girls. What was all that about? We come back from Colorado to Kansas in 1905. Well, I was playing up in this little town team of Nest City, Kansas in 1905 after I got there and also in 1906. Were you pitching? Not necessarily, no. Everything? Everything. Including pitching? And pitching. infield. I wasn't pitching, I was playing the infield. That was a semi-pro team? No, it wasn't even semi-pro, it was just a little town team. Nest City? Nest City, yeah. These were not the Boston Bloomer girls, these are what they called the National Bloomer girls out of Kansas City. Two boys played regularly on the team. The third baseman they called Lady Madison, put on a wig. And then they had another pitcher by the name of Compton, called him Lady Waddell, he wore a wig. Oh, they were advertised on posters several weeks before they got there, you know, that's where they did their publicity. They came in the fall of 1906 to play this exhibition game with us in this city. And uh, I had a good day against them, and this Logan Galbraith, who owned the club, I believe he offered me $21 a week to finish the last three weeks with him. Dad had lost his money on speculation in western Kansas land. We were very poor, and I got this opportunity to go with him. I'd worked all my life as a kid here and there, making 50 cents or a dollar or four dollars a week or something like that. And uh, had a chance to make this $20 a week, I suppose. But I never wore a wig. Did people point. know that these were men? or? Oh, they must have. They must have known. Although you get around those little country towns, they put those wigs on pretty good and so on, but they must have known. I didn't wear a wig. Didn't they know you were not a girl? Didn't the audience? Oh, sure, they knew I wasn't a girl. Was that legal? I mean, was that Oh, yeah, cricket? sure, as far as the, as the Bloomer girls were concerned. Anybody except the farmer boys would know that these fellows with wigs on weren't girls. They had postcards with a picture of the Bloomer girls on it, you know, and these girls would sell those things around. That's what they did, mostly. We did have one good girl ball player, and you've probably heard of her. Her, na her name was Ruth Egan, first baseman, and she grabbed that ball. She played first base with a catching glove, and uh, she could hit pretty well. What did you do in the locker room? What locker room? I mean, uh, there was all girls except for the we other. We had no ones. locker rooms in those days. You went home from the ball game in uniform. That's but, right. Oh. But we did that in the big league for years. We went out on buses and taxis later. And your father, when you decided to become a professional, earn your living this way, your father didn't feel that you were letting the family down and so No, no, he went. I was only 17 years old when I first reported a, my first professional job, and he went with me. He went with you? Oh, yes. Little old town of Hutchinson, Kansas, 116 miles from where we lived. Hutchinson, Kansas, in the Western Association. And uh, that how, was the beginning. How did they come to hear of you? They didn't have scouting systems in those days, or did they? When I went to Kansas City the next year, in 1908 in the spring, I pitched against several major league clubs as they were coming up from the south to come through Kansas City. And that way, I imagine, my name got to some of the clubs, especially to Boston and Washington. And the Boston club sent a scout to look at me in Kansas City. Did you get any kind of a bonus of any sort for signing? No. Lord, no, you were tickled to that to be able to get to, <laughs> get to play. Did you have any doubt that you would be a good ball player when you broke in? When I first broke into professional ball, I didn't have that idea. But as I went along and was so successful with strikeouts and so on, I was pretty fast. I could throw a ball about as hard as anybody outside of Walter Johnson, probably, and there wasn't much difference between us. But when I found out that I could throw that ball by a lot of these fellows, then I, it began to build up a little confidence, yes. You didn't have very much trouble with control either, did you? At the start, yes. When I first went up, yes. But afterwards, no. In a, in a couple of years, I could put that ball in that hole. But most of the time it was just rearing back and letting it go. You weren't throwing it. I was throwing the spots, sure. Uh, you, you had somebody that you knew could, couldn't hit a curveball low and inside. I might uh, get in the clutch and get two strikes on him and put it low inside or something like that. But as a rule, I was so fast that I was just rearing back and letting them go. And you threw a hard ball all the time. That's right. For nine innings. That's right. I never, I, I wasn't smart enough to throw a change of pace. And I, oh, I never, never threw over half a dozen curveballs, but I was fast. I could really throw that ball so that you know, a lot of these fellows say they did this and so on. Very few fellows ever lived could throw a ball fast enough to have a hump on it. I happen to be one of them. That's why they call you Smokey? Smokey. Yeah. Who gave you that name? Uh, a newspaper man by the name of Paul Shannon. who was on the Boston Post in, the, in Boston. After you got to the big leagues? Yeah. You started with the Red Sox in 1908. Mm -hmm. Well, I broke into Boston when I was only 18. The youngest man in the league, I think. I never saw a big league game until I broke into the big league. 
Did you think you'd make it when you got up there? Well, after I pitched a few games, I knew I'd make it because there was nobody as fast as I was except Walter Johnson in those days. I meant to ask you how you were treated when you came up as a rookie with the Red Sox. I wasn't looked down upon or, or shunned in any way. I think they paid just as much attention to me when I first came up as they did at any other time. I can't say that I was helped, but I never asked anybody a question. They didn't answer me truthfully, I don't think. Was Tris Speaker there when you got there? When I went to, to Boston, Speaker wasn't back yet that fall. He had been there and they had sent him out to Little Rock. He came back in a, in a month or something like that after I joined there. And the funny part of it was we started rooming together. We roomed together in American League for 15 years, both Boston and Cleveland. Tell me about him as an outfielder. There was nobody, nobody close to him, I don't think, Larry. He played from here to the road, back to second base. But I say he may be a little bit further than that, near out the garage at the most. But, oh, I'd say about 30, 40 yards back to second base. Of course, it was a dead ball in those days. But he could turn with a snap of the bat like that. He had that instinct, you know, that he knew where the ball was going, and he'd turn and look over his shoulder and grab it. He was really good. Oh, he was the best of all time. I yeah. think he has that reputation of being the best of yeah. all time. They talk about DiMaggio and those, so on. They were in that speaker's class. I never saw anybody who was his equal, but all around, hitting and fielding and throwing and running. Speaker I, wasn't much of a runner, was he? Oh, yes, he was only very fast. I mean, on the bases. Yes, but he didn't oh. go in for base stealing like Cobb and Clyde Milan and, those, and Max Carey and that bunch. But he stole quite a few bases all the time. And he could hit. Oh, I say he could, yes, sir. Was he a strong, well-built fellow oh, when he was yes, a young man? strong as a bull, yeah. What was he like as a person? Perfect. Yeah, I don't think spoke ever had an enemy. I say spoke, that's what yeah. we always called him. Great person, great personality. Great fellow. You take your real friends like Speaker and I were like that, and I'd have gone to hell for him and he'd have gone to hell for me. Is he the best baseball player you've ever seen? No. Ty Cobb was the best player I ever saw, and any ball player will tell you that. Any of my, any of the old time ball players, they won't even stop to think. Ty Cobb was the greatest ball player that ever lived. Ty Cobb would get on and beat you alone. I've seen many, many a time when he'd get on first base by bunting the ball to be sure to get on, bunt it, and then steal second, third, and home. He had every catcher in the, in the, in the league. It's crazy. He was one thought ahead of the average ball player. Now, Eddie Collins was a very, very smart ball player. I've seen Eddie have the ball ahead of Cobb. And this was an all-star game, an all-star series back in 1911 when I happened to be picked on an all-star club. I saw Eddie Collins have the, the ball ahead of Cobb and Cobb was still sliding safe. By sliding by and grabbing it with his hand or some damn way. He'd do it one way or another as he saw it. Ty would cut you down, there's no doubt about that. He'd cut you down if you didn't give him a spot to go into that bag. If you give him a spot, he told many and many, I heard him tell him, give me room to get in there and don't worry. But if you don't give me room, I'll cut you out to get in there. Which is good plain common sense, isn't it? Yeah. He did keep his spike sharp, there's no doubt about that. Were you around in big leagues the time that Cobb and Lajaway were battling for the crown? They chased the fell out of baseball right then, right in Cleveland. That's right. The time that, was it four or five hits that Lajaway got on bunts? You know who it was? Red Corbin. Less the fellow that was playing third base for St. Louis. Oh, he was a rookie then. Sure. Yeah. Red Corbin was chased right out of the league then, and you never heard of him until he came back in? As a coach, years and years and years later, <laughs> Lashley never hit a hit from a bunt in his life. He got four hits at the end of the from laying down bunts down third base. Line. That's because Cobb was so disliked. Cobb was the most disliked ball player, one of the most disliked. I remember that this Butch Smith, who was a great catcher over there, he, Butch Smith used to kick hell out of Cobb about every day. He was about twice as big as Cobb, too. But Cobb would come right back and choose him the next day. But you got along good with Cobb. Cobb was one of my very best friends, yeah. I wanted to ask you about Walter Johnson. Do you remember that 1912 game with Walter Johnson? Yes, very well. The reason that it was a big game, you, you got the, did you ever have, get the history of that game? I think so, but tell me. Well, there's four of us today that hold the American League record of 16 straight games, 16 straight wins without a defeat. Now, up at that time, Walter Johnson had his 16 and had lost his 17th. I had about 11. Well, old Foxy Clark Griffith 
comes in and is, Walter Johnson said, have the right to defend his uh, record of 16 straight, so he challenged Joe Wood to meet Walter Johnson. Well, hell, we pitched against one another many and many a time before, and even after that. There were very few pitchers ever lived, uh, uh, Larry, that had, had a fast enough ball where it would really rise. And I, I was one of them. Walter Johnson and I were the ones in those days. And so they advertised us like prize fighters with biceps and triceps and all that stuff. And that is the only time, uh, all the time I was there, and I don't think since that the, the uh, people who came to the game, the fans, were sitting right alongside the third baseline and the first baseline. We were sitting up, instead of sitting on our bench back where the benches are now, and where they were then, we were sitting on chairs right up alongside of those people that were along the line. Was that and in Fenway Park? Or yeah, Fenway it? Park. Yeah, it That's the year there. it was open. And I won one to nothing that day. But I, I, Walter Johnson, to me, was the greatest pitcher that ever lived. Beat I Johnson, had, one to nothing. Oh, yes. And, uh, of course, my God, if he'd had the club behind me, him that I had behind me, he never would have lost a game. I, that's the unfortunate part of Walter's pitching. He, he had a bad club behind him all the time, and I had a good club. But Walter, to me, my God, he was... He's the only pitcher that I ever hit against that I didn't know whether I swung under the ball or over the ball. I just missed it, that's all. And I don't know how, but you'd miss it. They always tell me that Walter Johnson had a deadly fear of hitting a batter. And I don't think he ever had any deadly fear of it, but uh, Walter would never throw it anyone. In fact, Walter and I say had more or less of an unwritten law between us that we wouldn't throw curveballs to one another. <laughs> And we just popped that fast one. He popped his fast one to me, and I popped my fast one to him. And one day he curved me and didn't tell me. <laughs> Jeez, I curved the life out of him then from then on. <laughs> yes, sir. I think he was the greatest pitcher that ever lived because I, I don't think probably with the same natural ability, maybe Matty might have even have been better, but Walter had the natural ability. My God, his arms would stretch from here over to there. You know, when he spread out here, he was a foot past mine on each side. And a great big fellow, well over 200 pounds, and if he wanted to, he could throw that ball right by you. But uh, to me, a man with natural ability, he was the greatest pitcher I ever saw. Matty with his fade away and so on. And Matty was, uh, I don't know whether you ever saw him pitch or not, did you? No, Probably I was not. a little bit before my time. Matty could start a curve there and he'd break it right down, come right down here. You know, as a rule, a curveball won't break if it's high. It breaks when it's low. But he could throw that curveball to the fellow standing like this and be up here. And First thing you know, it'd be right down there. And there wasn't one pitcher in a thousand who could break a curveball high. Cy Young, you watch Cy Young pitch. I was on the club with him. He went forever then, man. Yeah, yeah. Cy was already past his peak when oh you saw him. Oh my God, yes, yes. Could he still pitch? Not too well, no. He was a big fella. He was bigger than Ruth, and he, was a, he had a pot on him. And he used to sit there in Boston with a fellow by the name of Fred Putnam that had run this place. He had a drugstore and a restaurant and, and rooming place where we had a flat. And they used to sit there and they used to kill a quarter to a liquor every night. He and Fred Putnam, he's a terrific whiskey drinker, old Cy. How did he last so long under that? Well, maybe he just started in the later years. I don't know, but I know he was there at the last. A fellow that really drank, and what we always claimed a fellow should never take a drink until after a ball game in the evening, a fellow that happened to be a morning drinker and especially got away from anything but beer, he didn't last long. With a few exceptions, you know. I mean, Very few. Yeah. Like um, the Grover Cleveland Alexander and Bugs Raymond, I don't know if you like that. But that's the same today as it was then. Yeah. As far as rowdyism in baseball, I don't think there's any more then than there is now. The biggest trouble with all the youngsters in baseball or probably any other thing is chasing the women. Uh, damn women, you could have your phones taken out of they run you ragged. That was the big thing. And I don't think there's any more then, and there is no. Is there any game that sort of stands out in your mind as a game that really you got more kick out of than any other one? I, would... I think I got more kick out of the first World Series game than I did out of any yeah, other game. The very first World Series game you pitched when yeah. you beat Tezro. We got into the ninth inning that game. We're leading four to three, and there's men on second and third and one down. Fletcher is up first. I struck him out. Base hit beats us. A boot ties it. A sacrifice fly ties it. Then they sent up Doc Crandall. You heard of Doc Crandall. He never had struck out in the polo ground. They struck him out, too. So I had two strikeouts here in the, in the real clutch. I pitched in four games. Three of them, I guess, were against Tedro. The last one that I worked in that I finished was against Matty, I believe. Well, Matty was at the tail end of his career then. That was the game where Snodgrass dropped the pop fly. Last game of the 1912 series. Mm -hmm. 
And it was following that, wasn't it, that uh, Chief Myers and uh, Merkel didn't touch a fly ball? That it's a real story of that never did come out. Christy Matthews was his own fault if that ball was dropped because it was right in front of Merkel and he kept hollering for Myers and Myers was running all the way down the line to first base. That was your big, big, big year, wasn't it? Oh, yes. But 1912, I won 34 and lost five. I know. <laughs> and got three out of four in the World Series, three victories and one defeat. As a pitcher, I was at the top of the heap, right along with the best, Walter yeah, and I. You sure were. But my arm went bad right at the peak of my career. I never pitched it without a sore arm after 1912. That was a tough break for me because you'd have heard a lot more about me if I hadn't hurt the arm. 23 years old, and the next year my I couldn't throw. Yeah. Otherwise, I'd have, I'd have set a record that they'd been talking about yet, probably. And I'll never know what was wrong with the arms. Something went wrong, what it was, I'll never know. Christ, I was crazy about baseball. I loved to be in there. But I just couldn't. That's all there was to it. The old zip was not there. I think I started one game and didn't get too far, and I tried to finish a couple games. Each time I did, I couldn't raise my arm for about a week or ten days. And I really thought that the arm was going to be all right, but I, I never did. And now, if, you, if, if it is nowadays where they might have shot in some cortisone or something like that in my shoulder, it might, have, might not have bothered me, but I, my arm was terrible. So in 16, I didn't play at all, but in 15, I won 15 and lost five or five. I've been able to figure out you had a good season in 1915. You had a very low earned run. pitching about half the year, see? Yeah, but you had a very low earned run average, didn't oh, you? Yes. Very well. I led the league in that. And you won about 15 games. And lost five. But see, that's only half the number. I don't want to pitch about every two weeks or something like that. But my arm was terrible. Next year, I couldn't even play at all. I couldn't even sit like this and hold my arm there. I couldn't raise it. What did you do the next year? Nothing. I stayed right up here and fished. And then how did your arm feel the next year after that? I went down during the winter of 15 and 16. I went to New York. I commuted to New York every Monday morning and back on a Saturday night. And I went to a chiropractor down there behind locked doors all winter long. And then I worked out with Andy Coakley out in Columbia Gym. So I got in touch with Cleveland. They decided to take a chance and they made a deal with Boston for me and I went to Cleveland. They bought my contract because I told them I thought I was all right again. But I couldn't pitch. I tried it several times. But if I'd pitched the equivalent of oh, anything over three or four innings, I couldn't raise my arm for two or three weeks. So finally I got to a spot during the war in 18 that uh, several of our fellows were called away and they had several minor leaguers they had called back up and tried in the outfield and they were out there getting hit in the head. And so finally the secretary of the club came down and they said, why the hell don't you put Woody out there? He's a pretty good ball player. So they did, and I was lucky enough to get a good start and hitting well and so on, so I played the outfield for the next seven years for Cleveland. Wasn't it a strain to shift over from pitching to no, being no. an outfielder? No, the only difference was that as a pitcher, I was the top of the heap, and as an outfielder, I was just another ball player. That but you didn't the, have any trouble making the... Oh, Lord, no. I could go get them as good as anybody. And you did well as an outfielder? Not too bad. 300 hitter, more or less? Well, one year I was over 300. I think that's about the only year. Were you always a good hitter when you were a pitcher, too? Well, when I first went up, it was, it was more or less of a joy ride when I first went to Boston. But uh, later on, when I figured that a hit from a pitcher now and then would help win a ball game, then I really got serious about it, yes. I was around a 290. I never was a 300 hitter. But one year I had I hit about 365 in Cleveland one year. Only time in my life I ever hit over 300. <laughs> Yeah, what happened to you that year? That I haven't any bad. idea. <laughs> You've been at 366. I, I mean. haven't any idea. But I don't know of any case where a pitcher of such stature, you know, a star pitcher way up there, whose arm went bad and came back and made it as an outfielder, which is very rare. Well, I think Babe and I were the only two fellows that ever played both in the outfield and as a pitcher in the World Series. You were on the Red Sox when Babe Ruth came up. Oh, yes. He came with us in 14. Yeah. I went to what Boston was this, What was this kid like? You could see that he was a good ball player, and he loved it. Did he have, even as a youngster, the piano legs and the big torso? He had the piano legs, but he wasn't so big, no. He was a slender kid. Slender and well built. Was he a pleasant person? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Friendly person. Sure. <laughs> I laugh at him yet from the seat of him. He was the goddamnest man you ever saw in your life. <laughs> That's all there was to it. As a kid. Many, many times, his roommate was Ernie Shore. 
Many and many a time, Ernie went up to go to bed, and Dame would be in the bed right alongside of him. As a kid, with the babe. <laughs> he, was, he was only a little kid, though, or a big kid. Oh, he was a big kid. Yeah. Well, he was just a big hick, a big farmer boy. He come out of this convent, or I mean, he come out of this uh, home there in Baltimore. He never had been out at all until the year before. He just didn't know what it was all about. That's all. He'd been in this home for years. Was he? He was. He was very crude. I wouldn't, or you wouldn't, or anybody else that ever really knew Babe as he was. They want their kids to follow along in his footsteps. Of course, when I knew him, he wasn't drinking much, but I wound up drinking it pretty well. But his main fault when I knew him was women. Last time I saw him, he had a couple of blondes up here at Harry Harper's over in Jersey. With respect to girls, it was Babe more of a chaser than most? Oh, yes. Yeah. He'd go after a snake or they'd hold it for him. <laughs> he'd drop by and he'd always confided in me quite a little. They say, well, I bet 10000 on this race today, and so on, which he did, there's no doubt about that. They framed on him for several years. They, under, uh, they cut him down to Cuba and took him for all he had one winter. Babe Ruth could never manage himself, let alone manage the ball club, and the club owners knew that. They wasn't going to let him manage their ball club. That's one of the reasons why they could take Ty Cobb now. Ty Cobb was, a, was the greatest ball player that ever lived, and he figured that the other ball players should do things as well as he did, it. and he, they couldn't do it, and he, that, for that reason, he was a bad manager. How was Speaker as a manager? Now, Wonderful. Everybody played for him. Loved him. There was this mess with Hal Chase in 1918, where Christy Mathewson was managing Cincinnati, and Mathewson got rid of Hal Chase because he suspected him of trying to throw a game, and McGraw took him on. That was always a strange thing, too, but Hal Chase spent a year with McGraw after Mathewson didn't want him anymore. Hal Chase, do you remember I told you about 1911 when they picked me on an all-star club? Hal Chase was on that club. He was begging me to get Walter Johnson in a crap game, and I wouldn't do it, but I saw him get in this crap game, and I see he could spin those across there on the corners and bring him up sevens and elevens and so on whenever he wanted it. We started playing poker, and I was Hal was on my left, and we were playing a pretty fair poker game. I forget for us, fifty cent limit or dollar limit or something like that. Anyhow, I was forty or fifty bucks loser, and Hal was a good friend of mine. He says, "Don't cut my cards." He didn't tell me out loud like that, but he just told me, to "Don't cut my cards this time." I didn't, and Christy dealt me a set of fours. So I said to myself, uh, "Maybe a coincidence, may not be." So I threw him in the deck. I wouldn't play him. So the next time, I didn't cut his cards, and he dealt me another set of fours. So after that, I cut him, that's all. So I know he could handle him. Hmm. Was Hal Chase as great a fielder as they say he was? Oh, yes. Wonderful. And Hal was a strictly a individual player. Hal Chase would be playing first base, and he'd go over and field the ball on his right. And he'd throw that ball over that bag, whether the first baseman was there or not, he'd throw it right on into the dugout. Hmm. That's what I mean by being an individual player. He shouldn't throw that ball unless he could see who he's throwing to, but he'd make to his play and right over that bag, whether the pitcher was there or not. I've seen him do that several times. Chase and Harry Lord. Oh, Harry Lord was on our ball club in Boston. He never pulled anything like that when he was in Boston. But he and Chase got mixed up with something on the White Sox club, and uh, they chased him out. I read a book that just came out about the Black Sox. And in this book, the author says that these eight men were also throwing games in the 1920s as well as throwing the 1919 World Series. You were a big league ball player then. Did you people sense anything was wrong before it was exposed? We didn't sense too much, but our last series with the White Sox, we saw they weren't out to win. I think they could have beaten us. I don't believe that we could have won in 1920 if this thing hadn't happened to the White Sox because they had one of the finest ball clubs, my God, that ever, that ever was put together. Sycott used to be in Boston when I was there. I knew Sycott very well. And he told me in the Winton Hotel that they didn't dare win in 20. We don't dare win. Before the World Series? Before, Before the, the season was 1920? Over. Before the season was over. Hmm. The whole business is so funny that it's hard to understand. For instance, in that book, Psychotic comes out as a real grade A type of human being. And the author doesn't understand either. Why did these guys do that? I know, they needed money and so on, and they were they paid need bad, money. I they guess. They didn't need money. Chick Anno, he was the ringleader in that whole thing. He always was a louse. Everybody knew he was a louse. Psychot was on the same order, only not so openly. Psychot was a trickster. He was the one that paraffined that ball. 
Sackcut and Danforth and some more of those, they put paraffin in the seams and shined it on their pants, see? Now, that was illegal in those days. All those things were illegal. How could a man get away with it for years if it was illegal? Everybody talked about Eddie Sackcut's shine ball, so that the umpire must have known him. They couldn't see him put it on there. They'd throw the balls out on him. That's the reason they cut out the spitball. In order to get away from this trick stuff of the emery and the mud ball and the shiner, of course, it was all cheating. Sackcut was what they used to call knuckles. Just throw a knuckleball That's, uh, until he got this shiner, and then he then he was practically invincible. You can't hit that sailor ball. That's the only thing that made Sycott a great pitcher. And a man like Felsch, a great outfielder. A man like Jackson, one of the greatest hitters of all time. Jackson, to me, it, it was a pitiful case. Jackson couldn't read and write. He used to always take his roommate to go to the dining room. And his roommate would order a meal, and they'd say, bring me the same. He couldn't read. And uh, naturally, somebody said something, he'd follow him, probably. Fels was that type of fella, too. But not Sweet Reisberg, not uh, Buck Weaver, not Eddie Sycott, not uh, Mac Mullen. That's what I call, I can look over this series, and I can't understand how Weaver could have been connected to that thing. The only way I can figure that Weaver was connected with that, they mentioned it to him, and he wouldn't report it. Now, this Claude Williams, he's no dumbbell. There was only a couple of fellas that were... Uh, really uh, morons on that club, and that was Happy Fouch and Joe Jackson. Gandal retired the next year and never went back to baseball. He never had a friend in baseball. He was a terrific partner. Well, you pitched against Joe Jackson. Was he uh, as amazing a hitter, as they say? Oh, yes. Yes, sir. He, he was one of the very best that ever lived. Joe Jackson would stand up there and he'd swing from his tail and practically throw himself down. But he got two strikes on him, he'd choke up a little on his bat. The other book I read was a biography by uh, Ty Cobb. And at the end of the book, he has a whole section that was all news to me on some mess up with him, you, and Tris Speaker, and yeah. Dutch Leonard. And would you tell me what that was all about? I will. I'm not going to tell you details because I wouldn't tell you too much about this thing. It's, it, it stinks. When Dutch Leonard got through in Detroit, Cobb was the manager. And for that reason, he had a gripe against Cobb. And then he wanted Speaker to take him on over in uh, Cleveland. The spoke wouldn't take him on. And for that reason, he got sore at both of them. Well, in 20, there was a dispute over some betting. In order to get even, Leonard claimed that this and that and so on. And there was a bet placed on the ball game, But it was not against our club. It was on our club. I was the guy that bet the dough. I, I guess I had charge of the money. Well, I handled this through a gate tender in Detroit who contacted the bookies. And uh, their money was bet, the money was collected, and this little son of a gun come down, we knew him very well, this gate tender in Detroit, and brought this money down to the train as we were leaving Detroit. And I gave him, after keeping equal splits for three fellas, I gave him the extra money, which amounted to about 30 or 40 bucks, for placing the bet. And this was just the same as betting on a prize fight or anything else. So we bet on ourselves. There was nothing crooked about it on our part. How often did teams bet on themselves? Never. Or Never. That's the only bet I ever made in my life. And that is because somebody else wanted to bet it and I handled the money. But this thing in 20 wasn't exactly on the up and up. I've got to admit that. Because I knew from what Psychot had told me in Cleveland that the White House didn't dare win. But I didn't know through a couple other fellows on the Detroit ball club that they weren't going to play their heads off to beat us. That wasn't they were going to say we were going to lay down and give you the game. They didn't. Yeah. That wasn't said. Well, anyhow, I knew that the White House didn't dare win that year. And this got back to Landis, and he had a letter that I had written. And uh, Landis called me over to New York and said, did you write that letter? And I said, I sure did. That was my name on it. And Leonard had blackmailed Navin in Detroit for so much for that letter, and he still kept copies of it. And then he went ahead and tried to blackmail, I don't know how the hell he tried to get some more money out of somebody out of that, by going after Cobb and, and spilling this whole story, which was true. I was at the World Series with Landis down in New York, and he says, this is Landis, I know Judge Landis very well. The judge says, are you going to have any trouble over this thing, Joe? And I says, I don't think so. He says, you let me know if you do. And I says, I'll make a trip up to New Haven. It was a letter you wrote. Yeah. Leonard, there he kept this letter that I had written him. After I got home here one winter, I wrote him out in Fresno a letter, the same as I'd write to my brother. I trusted him, and I wrote him this letter, and he kept it and cashed in on it. I understand he got twelve or $15,000, the first from Navin in Detroit. 
and they cost it for a while, and then he came out with it again. But he kept the letter all the time. The letter had that much dynamite in it. Yeah. The letter was quoted the, the amount of money it was bet, and his share was enclosed in the letter. I loaned that son of a bitch two hundred dollars to buy his first motorcycle in Boston when he first joined us. And he made the crack that he didn't mind what he was doing to Cobb and Speaker, but he hated Hurt Woody. But nevertheless, he did it. That dirty little son of a bitch of a Leonard. He died a millionaire, but he died young. And a great little picture, too. But he was a first-class crook. How did Speaker and Cobb get involved in it? Cobb and Speaker put up some of this money to make the bet. And uh, Leonard broadcast this thing because Cobb let him go and Speaker wouldn't take him on. Is it for that reason that both Cobb and Speaker left their jobs at Cleveland and Detroit? Yeah. Yeah, but they didn't get out of baseball. They went to the athletics. I'd like to see what Cobb had to say about it because I don't believe Cobb would tell the real dog. They got together with an attorney in Detroit. My greatest friend spoke to Cobb, and they got a bunch of stuff written up and typewritten and deposited in a vault in a bank in Cleveland. And if they would have chased Cobb and speakered out of baseball, this would have all come out. Cobb has a whole chapter on it. He doesn't hide it at all. Well, he didn't hide something, but he didn't tell it as it was. I'll bet you a million bucks. I don't believe Cobb could afford that to tell a story. Yes, I know the story yeah. to be true. I have never told that to a soul in my life. I haven't even told it to my brother. Hmm. Well, I didn't tell you anything that wasn't straight and on the level, I'll tell you that. That's one reason why this thing did really hurt me, when, because that's the first and only accusation in my life that I ever had against me that I know of. Hmm. You were in the Clevelands when Ray Chapman was killed, weren't you? I carried him off the field, Leslie Nunnemaker and I, yes. It must have been a terrible thing. It was because this dirty louse of a Carl Mays, who incidentally was quite a pitcher. I understand, I don't know this for sure, but he made the crack to some of the fellows that he was going to take Chappie out of there that day. Is that right? In fact, after he hit him, hit him back there at the base of the skull, after he hit him, he went in and picked up the ball and threw it to first and raised hell with the umpires because they didn't call him out. And uh, Chappie never did come to. You knew Stanley Kowalski? Oh, yeah. He and I used to play three cushions together all the time. Three cushion pitchers. He's running a gas station out at South Bend, Indiana. He was a great pitcher. Yes, he was. He was one of the best spitball pitchers I ever saw. Yeah, a great competitor. He won, incidentally, he's one of the pitchers that won three games in one World Series, but that was a five out of nine series against Brooklyn in 20. And you were in that series, too, weren't I you? I was an outfielder in that yeah. series. Yeah. You must have been there the day that Bill Worms guns made the owner so oh, sure. Did you know oh, what yeah. the hell happened all of a sudden? Bang, 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 three oh, outs. Sure. sure, you can see it. When he caught this ball, he went over and uh, tagged second base, and the other fellow ran right into him. That was your trouble. You were on a college faculty for how many years? I was on no college faculty. I was a baseball coach, and that was all. How, how long did you coach at Yale? 20 years. 1923, starting in the spring of 23 through 42. How did you get to go to Yale? How did that come about? A fellow likes baseball. He, he stays around it as long as he can. And I was just about through because I'd already been in the league for 15 years. And my arm had gone bad and I was just another ball player as an outfielder. So this folk came and asked me what I'd like to go. And I told him, sure. Because in those days, our youngsters were just, they were very young. We'd come home off a trip of three or four weeks. The kids wouldn't know who I was. So I was more or less of a homebody. And I thought I'd rather be so that I'd be around the kids and the family more. So I accepted the offer to go there. They took over my big league contract. They made the same money as I'd given in Cleveland. Did you enjoy those 20 years? I can't say that I enjoyed it as much as playing myself, because it's much easier to do a thing yourself if you have the ability than to try to sell some kids how to do it. Yeah. And that is one of the toughest things to do at Yale. These boys would rather come out and make an athletic team than they would to graduate Phi Beta Kappa. They'd come out and here I am, make a ball player out of me. And you knew damn well the minute you saw them, they couldn't play ball. That is the toughest job we had, was to cut those boys off of the squad. Any good ball players come out of there that later played professional baseball? Very few. It's a class of boy who goes to Yale, Harvard, and Princeton that, as a rule, have something bigger in mind when they get out rather than to go into professional ball. But you still enjoy baseball very much. Oh, Lord, yes, I do. Even to watch it. I stop by all these little league, midget league games. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you had to do it all over again, would you be a ball player like you were? No, oh, yes. I had to do all over again. The chances are I would have saved my arm a little. I used to love to throw. I had such a good arm. I used to like to see that ball go. And I used to stand and practice as a catcher to throw to second base and so on. It's rare back and let her go.
I probably wouldn't have done all that. I'd probably save my arm like Whitey Ford does. He's a little kink or something. He goes and gets out and stuff like that. I think if Mickey Mantle hadn't been plagued with this trouble he's had for these years, I think he's one of the greatest ball players that ever lived. As I said when he first went in there, I made the crack. I said, he'll make them forget about Joe DiMaggio. And I think if he'd have been whole all the time, I think he would have. I was a lot like Mantle when I first started. I, my first year with the Red Sox, I had a broken toe. And later on, I had appendicitis and different things. And I only pit, really pitched three years, 10, 11, and 12. But I, even with that, I won 115 games directly in those three years. But I used to love to be in there. I don't know of anything that I would rather have done. Not very many men can say that. In fact, as I've always said, my life has been a vacation, and, and if I, I'd have played ball for nothing if I could have afforded it. I know that's all I lived for when I was a kid, was to play baseball. Smokey Joe Wood, I hate to say it, but his name was really Howard. Smokey Howard Wood, the family went to a circus when he and his brother were kids, and there were two clowns there, Mo and Joe. And the brothers thereafter, one was called Mo and one was called Joe. So Smokey Joe Wood came from the Joe, but it really was Howard on its birth certificate. Smokey Joe Wood was in the major leagues for 15 years from 1908 to 1922. He was with the Red Sox and the Cleveland Indians. He was one of the great pitchers of his era, hurt his arm, came back to the big leagues as an outfielder, and one year hit over 350 as an outfielder. Joe Wood, after his career as a ball player, became a baseball coach at Yale University. And prior to his death in 1985, when he was 95 years old, the president of Yale University, Bartlett Giamatti, who later became the commissioner of baseball, presented him with an honorary Yale degree. He had never graduated from high school, and this pleased Joe Wood just tremendously. To be presented with an honorary doctorate by Yale University was a great great thing in his life. I hope you enjoyed this voice from the past. I'm not sure what I enjoyed most. Maybe his story about Babe Ruth and how they thought he ate too much was a, was a really good one. Um, but I'd love to hear from you and you can tell me what your favorite part of the interview was. And if you want to do that, you can just simply email me at uh, tbinbb at gmail.com. Send me a direct message on Twitter, on Instagram, Facebook, wherever you see fit. You can always find me at This Day in Baseball. And I'd love to hear what your favorite part of the interview was. Now, I had found this clip on YouTube, and you can check it out under quotation marks Smokey Joe Wood in the Primetime 798 channel. Now, if you enjoyed the show, just please help us out. Share the show, tell a friend, subscribe, and we love any reviews or feedback you can give us. And if you want to get content as it's coming out, you can subscribe right on our website. You just go to the subscribe button right on the blog, and it's easy to fill out. All you need is your email. You hit subscribe, and you get new content that's coming out. There's no spam. It's just content. It'll be images, podcasts blog post, whatever comes out. You can control how it comes to you. You can get a weekly digest, daily, however you'd like to get it. But it's a really great way to stay in touch with us to know when new content's coming out. Now, if you want to help us out, you can also join the stayinbaseball.com and you can sponsor Smokey Joe Woods page or any other events page. Just check it out at thisdayinbaseball.com slash sponsorship. We have over 100,000 pages on thisdayinbaseball.com. And I can guarantee you, if you haven't been to the site, if you go there, you're going to find just a treasure chest full of content. And it can be anything from bizarre games like lost home runs. We have I think it's 250 articles on lost home runs, whether it was weather or some other reason, which is kind of a cool subject. It's not something you think about a lot. Um, in the suspensions, there's three home run games, no hitters. There's so many different categories and so many things. If you love baseball history, you just get lost in looking at the content. And that's it for today's show. I hope you enjoyed it. And later this week, I'm going to have Stan the Man Musual for you. And until then, we hope to see you at the ballpark. 
Peace. Oh, get him, tiger. Rawr. We're all behind our baseball team. Go get him, tiger. World Series bound and picking up, picking up steam. Go get him, tiger. There'll be joy in Tiger Town. We'll sing you songs when the Bengals bring the pennant home. 